Hi, welcome back to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction Podcast, where the fans of classic fantasy adventures can hear the serialized audiobooks of a fellow nerd and indie author completely for free. The story portion of this episode starts at about the minute and a half mark. I'm your author, narrator, and host, Brandon Wilborn. If you've made it this far into the podcast, I really want to thank you for listening. There's always that little nagging thought of, was anybody going to actually read this or listen to this? But the podcast numbers are surprisingly growing every week, and I'm not doing any significant marketing while I get a solid handle on this new skill and the workflow that goes with it, which means some of you guys are sharing. For that, a thousand thanks. Last week in The Treasure of Capric, Curian was shocked when his interrogation of the King of the Caves spy turned into an offer to escort them to the king's door. Curian also had an unsettling encounter with a babbling madman who seemed to know a little bit too much about their plans and who mysteriously echoed the prophecy that terrified the abbot. Then Captain Fallon revealed himself to Curian and Tobin, leading to a fight in which Fallon underestimated his young opponents. This week will take us all the way through Chapter 6. Now I present for your enjoyment, The Treasure of Capric. Curian's blood thudded in his ears. He had reacted solely on instinct when Captain Fallon pulled the dagger on them. He didn't know that he could move that swiftly during a real fight. It felt as if his body moved before he thought about it. Tobin had held back again when Curian attacked, but his clear mind had been there when he needed it, setting up an ambush and throwing the powder from the vial around his neck into the soldier's eyes. If their trainer had been right and Tobin had made a good throw, he would be blind for a couple of days. We have to go, Curian grunted. What happened? Alden asked, looking concerned. We just assaulted the head of Vivacius' personal guard, Curian said. Louise laughed. You make friends everywhere, don't you? Well, when somebody pulls out a knife to shake hands, a kick to the head sounds reasonable, Curian responded. Now do you believe we're not working with Vivacius? She smiled and nodded. He turned to Alden. What's the fastest way out of here? Your supplies should be ready soon, Alden said, rubbing the smooth patch on top of his head. But what do we do with him? He won't stay unconscious for long. He shouldn't be too much of a threat, said Tobin. The powder I threw in his face should blind him for a couple days. He's out, Reese said, lifting up the captain's head and letting it clunk back onto the floorboards. I say we leg it. I agree, Alden added. However, I think it would be wise to exit through the rear passage Louise used yesterday. You don't know if there are other guards waiting outside for you. He picked up a small pack and started filling it with personal items scattered around the room. I will ride ahead and tell the king you are coming. He'll want to know of Asius' newest plot to find him, and he may be able to send you some help. Be safe, Louise said. I believe your road will be much more perilous than mine, Alden said. Do not fear. If the king truly gave you this task, then you are ready to see it through. I only wish I could offer you more guidance. He embraced her and then grabbed Curian by the shoulder. I will not forget. You promised her safety. With that, he rushed out of the room with the bag slung over his shoulder. Tobin and Curian retrieved their bags and weapons from the next room where the two of them had slept. When they returned, Louise reached behind the bed. They heard the soft click of a latch and the hidden door swung silently open showing them a dark corridor. She led them inside where they followed it toward the back of the inn to a set of descending stairs. At the bottom, she opened a door and looked out into the alley. It looks clear, she said, and they all filed out, making their way to the stables on the corner. The innkeeper was putting the last pack on a pony when they entered from the side door. Alden said you'd be sneaking off in a hurry, he said, clearly annoyed. Nothing better be broken from your scuffle. He wagged a finger at Curian and Tobin, and then turned back to securing the load, muttering about being caught up in so much trouble. When he finished, he handed the reins to Curian. Don't you work Greta too hard, he scolded. Greta's a stubborn one, and if you're not kind, she'll bolt with all your goods. Thank you, was all Curian could say. The innkeeper scoffed and went back inside. Curian paused and looked at his friends, suddenly reluctant to take the first step of the long journey to find the king of the caves. In two days, he had already made so many mistakes that he wondered whether the abbot wasn't right about his ability to become a full brother. He was overwhelmed with the feeling that their task was impossible. Planting his staff firmly, as if to pin down his fleeting courage, he finally spoke to the others. I suppose we'd better hurry. 
Tobin insisted that they pray before setting out, and even Louise consented. Curian only stared at his feet until it was over. Following Louise, they stepped out into the alleyway again, turning away from the main street. She wound through down Rivertown using alleys and side streets as much as possible, but always heading east and north. Curian listened for pursuit, but heard only the sounds of the waking city. A rooster crowed late, and men called to each other from the docks to the south, but they encountered no people as they hurried down the alleys between the tall, cramped buildings. As the excitement of his earlier fight wore off, he shivered in the cool autumn air. Louise eventually turned left onto a wide street. A few people gawked at them as they passed, having never seen Capric monks. Passing a guard asleep at his post, they hurried through the north gate and disappeared into the gloom of the plain. Chapter 6 A Dark Fate Captain Fallon woke to the surly little innkeeper slapping his face. Wake up, you drunk. This isn't your room, and I don't like weapons in my inn. He knew that he was lying face down on the floor, but everything was white. No shapes, shadows, or colors came to his eyes. His hand shot out and grabbed the man's tunic. Then he pulled him down until he could feel his breath on his face and stared at him with blind eyes. Go, the god, he growled. He felt the man begin to tremble. I will, he whined. I am Captain Fallon, head of Lord Evasius' personal guard, and the monks who were staying here attacked me. If you don't do all you can to aid me in capturing these fugitives, you may take their place at the gallows. Yes, yes, sir, the innkeeper stuttered. Fallon suddenly smelled the sour tinge of urine, and he knew he had made his point. Pushing himself upright made the back of his head ache and made him feel nauseous. Wait, how long have I laid here? Four hours, I suppose, said the innkeeper. Those monks left early this morning when I was cleaning out the stables. Then I came inside to start cooking for lunch and eventually made it up here to tidy their rooms for new guests and found you on the floor with your sword. Sorry for the rude waking, but normally men sprawled on the floor is drunk round here. And you isn't wearing a uniform. Those monks did something to me, and I can't see, Fallon said. You need to lead me downstairs and then alert the nearest guards you find that their captain requires them to muster at your tavern in a quarter hour. Tell them to bring as many as they can gather. The innkeeper grabbed him by the hand and helped him to his feet. He was dizzy at first, but quickly regained his balance. This was not the first time he'd taken a blow to the head in combat. Whatever poison the monks had thrown in his face must be worsening the effects of their attack. He told the man to grab his sword and scabbard, and they carefully made their way down the narrow stairs. Fallon rubbed his eyes, and then his head while he waited for the innkeeper at one of the tables. The man had been smart enough to hurry his customers out before going to find the guard, so Fallon was alone. The dizziness and weariness might be from the blow or his blindness, maybe even from the witch checking on him. Evasius was going to be furious at his failure, and he knew Muna would have been trying to sense him during the time he was unconscious. Whether she could do that or not, he didn't know. Suddenly, with the thoughts of her, he was overwhelmed with desire for her. He felt compelled to return to Pollingham Castle to lie with her, to feel her scarred flesh against his own again. A shudder ran through his body. Was this some sort of effect from the tie they had formed? Or was this her way of drawing him, calling him back on his lord's orders? He could not return to the castle immediately. Returning empty-handed would be humiliating enough, Perhaps beginning the search for these rogue pawns would do something to redeem him. They could not oppose his master. And even though his blindness prevented him from pursuing them personally, he had the power to get men on their trail. He prayed the spell would wear off and he could be there for their capture. He rubbed his eyes again and thought that he might be seeing a shadow in his white blind vision when he turned his head back toward the stairs. The tavern door opened and he heard several men enter the room. I've brought them the innkeeper said. Should I bring anything to drink or eat? Fallon shook his head. Who is highest ranking, and how many are you? He asked the men. Captain Fallon, sir, it's Lieutenant Wilson, a clear voice spoke. Five men are with me, and several more are on the way. Are you all right, sir? I'm not your concern, Lieutenant, Fallon smiled. Is old Griggs on duty? If not, 
Get him. He's the best tracker I know. Korean and the others stopped a mile beyond the gates. The road dissolved into a thick fog only a few yards ahead, so they left it and headed east, climbing in and out of the estuaries of the old river delta. Pursuit might not be likely yet, but they didn't want to offer an easy trail for the soldiers to follow. One rut proved deep enough to hide them from ground level unless someone stood directly on the bank, and they followed it as it wound northeast toward the avenue of the dry riverbed. Even though they were essentially invisible, they did not slow down and kept a quick pace until the heat of the day tired them and the fear of pursuit waned. They rested only briefly, eating a light meal and allowing the pony to graze before they continued walking throughout the day. The soft, dusty floor of the riverbed made walking harder, slowing them down and taxing their endurance in the morning, so they left the riverbed to cover more ground on their second march. The fog lifted in the afternoon, but there was nothing to see on the empty plain. Soft grass stretched out before them, broken here and there by trenches dug out by the river long before. No farms or homesteads remained this far out of town, and there were no resources to draw people to settle in the flat green sea of the plains. They had traveled longer and faster than they had planned, and their feet slowed with exhaustion as the light slowly faded. They climbed back into the deep estuary they had followed that morning to rest for the night. A cold meal of dried meat and fruit served as their dinner, since they did not want to risk a fire if Lord Avasius's soldiers were looking for them. The night was cold and the second day was much like the first, walking long hours over the plains, following their estuary until it merged with the main bed of the Apos. As evening neared, they approached the village of Smithfield. Small cottages with fallen roofs stood beside abandoned fields and broken animal pens. Nothing stirred as they stepped onto a narrow lane that led to the small cluster of houses that made up the village ahead. The riverbed on their left bent closer to the road as it neared the town, and then turned sharply east after passing the village. A well stood at the center of town. Beside it towered a large oak tree, its leaves fallen and scattered early before the coming winter, or else already dead. Its roots had broken through the stones of the well, trying to find water. No birds nested in its dry, empty branches, blackened in the failing light from dark moss and lichen. Curian looked at the tree and the rotting buildings and thought that Apiford was not far from the same fate. I wonder if any of these houses still have beds, said Rhys. They may, Curian replied, but I fear what we may find in them. This is no longer a place for the living, and we should leave whatever is here to its rest. Bridges provide more shelter than you might think, Louise said, pointing to the arched stone bridge at the end of the street. Curian agreed. At least we'll be more protected than last night, and since we've already come so far, we may be able to travel a bit beyond Aberford tomorrow and hide in the emptiness of the plains again. I don't want to be caught between Capric Hill and Pollingham. I have a feeling there may be more travel between them than is normal. They found a rope coiled among Greta's packs so they lowered their water skins into the well to refill them and then walked to the bridge. The road continued for a short distance before the grasses of the plain began to reclaim it from disuse. Just where their vision failed in the dusk, the road seemed to disappear altogether, as if it never had a destination. After climbing under the bridge, they unburdened the pony and settled in for the night. Curian looked at his companions, preparing their blankets for rest. Reese laid himself at the westward opening, from which pursuit was most likely to come. Tobin moved further under the cover of the bridge, with Louise next and Curry in closer to the eastern opening. The long, wearying walk had even driven thought from his mind as he struggled just to keep his feet moving. Now, though his body cried for rest, his mind began to run. They had spoken little during their travels, and Curry in suddenly felt the need to talk as if the loneliness of the abandoned town had stirred his need for speech more than the empty gray of the plain. He sat down with his back against the stones of the bridge, but too many questions crowded his head to know what to say or ask. Do you love him, Miss Prescott? He finally said quietly. Do I love whom? Louise asked. The king of the caves. Louise raised herself up on one elbow and searched Curian's face before answering. Yes. Curian nodded. It was the first time she had spoken to him without her guard of sarcasm and contempt. But not in the sense you mean, I think, she added. 
Behind her, Tobin sat up and crossed his legs. Then how? Tobin asked. Whether the reports we heard are exaggerated or not, the man is clearly hiding for a reason, and we know from personal experience that he is not above theft. If it's not love, said Kurian, then what drives you to follow the man? What makes you do as he asks when there is no sense in the request? Such as escorting three young monks through the wilderness, she said. That would be the first example to come to mind. He did not know why he couldn't help but answer her with the same feigned impertinence that she usually offered. I already said it is love, she said, and again there was no affectation in her voice or expression. What I said when I grabbed you in the street wasn't a lie or just a part I play to be his spy. I was an orphan. My parents lived in a town much like this one and as it died around them, they decided to move somewhere that was still alive. At least, for a while. She paused for a moment. He could barely see her face now, but he heard her sigh. They were killed on the road by a group of highwaymen, and the last thing my father did was put me on a horse and send it running. A young couple found me wandering and took me in, until I ran away a month later. I was confused and scared. As much as I wanted to find my parents, I had nightmares of the highwaymen finding me. I spent the next two years wandering between small towns on the coast, learning to live off scraps and hide from all the people who take an interest in frightened little girls on the street. I'm sorry, Kurian said. You don't have to be, she said, but there was no scorn for his meaningless sentiment in her voice. Eventually I moved inland, and when I passed through Dury, the king found me. He found me and taught me and made me part of a new family. And it was enough. It was more than I had ever had. Those men in his camp that you're so afraid of cared for me like a sister. None of them would let any harm come to me, least of all the king. I love him as I loved my father, only more so. I would fulfill any of his requests because I trust him which is why I willingly went back to wandering, playing an orphan for a time so that I could be invisible, to see and hear what others could not, and then pass that information to people like Alden to help the king. But because of him, it was only acting. I am no longer an orphan. Can you say as much about your order? Her comparison to his own father leaving him stung. She was obviously ignorant of the way the order worked. We were all left at the compound by our parents, if you want to call that orphaning, Kurian said. It is an honor to be accepted, and since coming there, I have at least found these two who are truly like brothers. As for commitment, I would die to carry out the oath I took to God. Commitment is not love, Tobin said. His tone was sad, and Kurian couldn't help thinking the sadness was for him. Very true, Louise almost whispered. Our brothers care for each other, he said defensively. We would die for each other. Some of us have. It sounds as if you will all do your duty, Louise said calmly, and that is more faithfulness than I have seen in most throughout Pollingham. Curian was about to respond when Louise breathed in sharply. Someone's coming, she whispered. Kurian turned his head to listen and raised himself to a crouch. I don't hear anything, he said. Neither did I. Somehow, I just feel it. Tobin tapped Reese, who had fallen asleep while they talked, and they both picked up their staves and hid deep in the shadows of the bridge, waiting and listening. Kurian did the same and crept past the pony toward his end of the bridge, peering into the dark beyond their shelter. He could not hear or see anything in the riverbed or on the road but Greta shook her head and pawed the ground nervously. Kurian listened until it seemed his own breathing and the shifting of his robes were the only sounds under the dark bridge. Nothing came from beyond their shelter. His heart had slowed down from the initial tension when he turned to tell the others it was a false alarm. As soon as his back faced the riverbed, he heard a gentle shuffling behind him. He ducked behind Greta and listened. The sound of carefully treading feet came again, like somebody groping along in the darkness. Greta sidestepped away from the noise and the shuffling stopped. A voice came from the night. Hello? 
Kurian's heart raced again. There was no way of knowing who was out there. It could be robbers using the abandoned town to hide, or soldiers set on their trail by Captain Fallon. Hello? The voice called feebly. The fear he heard in the voice might be a ruse to gain their confidence. He didn't know whether to answer or not. Tobin crept up to his side and whispered in his ear, Reese is checking the bridge. At almost the same moment, he heard movement above him. Reese was never good at sneaking. The accidental tap of his staff on the stones made the cautious steps stop again. The voice trembled as it called out again, Is somebody there? Don't come any further, Kurian said in the deepest voice he could manage. We have you outnumbered, and it's best if you go back from where you came. I don't want to hurt anyone, and I don't want any trouble, said the voice. I know that voice, Tobin whispered. Then he stood up before Kurian could stop him. Nomen? How, how do you know me? It's us, said Tobin. Tobin, Kurian, and Reese. Praise God, Nomen shouted. Can it be true? He rushed forward and fell to his knees in front of Kurian and Tobin. You're alive. I didn't want to hope for it. But you're alive. Of course we're alive, Tobin laughed. You only sent us on our mission a few days ago. Reese jumped down from the bank and landed next to Tobin. Yes, your mission. Noman grabbed Tobin's robe and almost pulled him over. Did you get it? Did you? No, Kurian said flatly. Not yet. Noman let go of Tobin and fell onto his side. Then it's gone, he wailed. It's all lost. Not completely, Kurian said. We are on our way to retrieve it now. It doesn't matter. Everything's gone. The dean rolled on the ground, wailing like a child. All lost. Everything. What do you mean? Tobin asked. Dean, what are you doing all the way out here? He burned it. He killed them all. They made out through the sobs. Soon he regained control of himself and spoke plainly. Evasius murdered them all. He burned the entire compound, the buildings, the oak. I only survived because I was in town. When I saw the fire and the soldiers, I hid. The soldiers roamed around all night looking for survivors. I hid in the tanner's attic until they left the next evening. And then I ran. No, Tobin whispered, and his legs crumpled beneath him. Kurian felt like Noman had stabbed him in the gut. He screamed with rage and pounded his fist on the stones of the bridge. We have lost the treasure, and our order has been destroyed, Noman said as if in a trance. The Caprix are no more. The boys stared at their teacher. The only home they remembered was gone, everyone they knew dead. Any chance of a future disappeared from thought. Louise finally broke the stillness. Walking forward from her hiding place under the bridge, she lightly touched each of them on the shoulder and paused for a moment. You can't mourn this loss in a single night, she said. We should sleep. It will quiet the pain for now. The other shoe has dropped. Lord of Asius lived up to his politician-sounding name and lied to the boys about everything. But it seems he overestimated how easily they would get him the lead on the King of the Caves, and in his eagerness, destroyed the Capric Order before he had his prize. Now it's a race. Can Louise, Curian, and his friends get to the King before Fallon's trackers find them? And will their dean, Noman Goodman, be a help or a hindrance in their quest? Join me next Friday as the treasure of Capric continues. I don't have a behind-the-keyboard segment, but I wanted to start something shorter for those weeks when I haven't prepared anything else. So here's the morsel of wisdom to chew on for the week. This one is Proverbs 21.23 from the NASB. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. I've had to learn this lesson in my own life that the words I say and how I say them can lead to serious conflicts. And when there's serious conflict with people, it can definitely trouble your soul. It can go way deep. 
As someone who's worked in youth ministry with teenagers for a long time, I see examples of it every semester. Somebody lets loose what they think is a funny joke, and sometimes it starts a long-term smoldering cold war between friend groups, and that makes it no fun for anybody. Of course, it can have other subtler effects, but those don't always trouble the kid with the careless words. But I'm learning this lesson even more as a dad. I see it in my kids and in myself. My words certainly, and my delivery, have an impact upon them, and cumulatively, the habitual ways I speak to them kind of build up. If I'm not careful, it'll lead them down some dark paths that will certainly trouble my soul as their loving father. Between the siblings, these harsh words lead more immediately to pain and agitation, and you get a lot of huffs and chuffs and grumpy faces. Sometimes it's funny when one of them actually says something critical with the preface of, well, I'm not trying to be mean, but I noticed they just haven't completely figured out that unnecessary critique can be just as painful even when spoken with pristine manners. There are a lot of other similar tidbits like this about the trouble or the benefit that your tongue can bring you in the book of Proverbs, and I recommend you check them out. But for this week, you can chew on that morsel of wisdom, guard your tongue, enjoy a little more peace in your soul. If you enjoyed this episode and you agree with me that the world could use more hope-filled fiction, you can be a part of helping me continue to write and read these stories. Please subscribe and give the show a five-star rating, whatever that looks like in your app. Secondly, find another fantasy lover and share it with them, please. If you've had long conversations with somebody about Narnia or Middle Earth or Paralandra even, they might also enjoy the world of Pollingham, as gloomy as it is sometimes. Thank you again for listening to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction Podcast. Until next time, Godspeed. The Treasure of Caprick is available in print and ebook formats from all major booksellers. Find a link to your favorite retailer in the show description or go to brandonwilborn.com. That's brand on, not brand off, and Wilborn is as simple as you can make it. W I L B O R N. This has been The Treasure of Caprick, Book One of The King of the Caves. Written and narrated by Brandon M. Wilborn. Copyright Brandon M. Wilborn.